All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so Dr. Bontempo and I are going to tag team this lecture. I'm going to do the first half. She's going to do the second half. And uh, the goal of the lecture is really, so you want to send that PE home. And it's not just that. Dr. Bontempo would be talking about, you want to send that AFib home too. And I know what you guys are thinking. This sounds nuts. I don't know if we can do this. W, T, R. So what are the risks? What's the <laughs> risk here for sending this PE home and sending that AFib home? So again, I'll do the pulmonary embolism part. Dr. Bontempo will be doing the AFib part. Okay, so let's think for a little bit. You're in the ED, you see a 35-year-old female. Are you gonna send the following people home? And this is a rhetorical question, but I want you to think a little bit about what we consider high risk and low risk. So let's say you have a chest pain patient. That patient's 35 with chest pain and a heart score of two. Are you sending that patient home? Yeah, probably. Pneumonia patient, 100% room air? Probably. Diverticulitis, afebrile? Probably. Influenza, of course that temperature could be 104 and you'd probably still send them home. Cellulitis with a 2% total body surface area? Yeah, probably, even if they have an abscess. You're gonna cut it open, you're gonna give some antibiotics, and you're gonna send them home. But a PE, normal vital signs, no comorbidities. How many people have discharged PEs? Oh, so we're, we're doing this now, okay. All right, so some of you guys are, are, have, have, uh, have crossed the, the chasm there. They've, you've, you've made it to the other side, so that's good. <laughs> I would encourage the rest of you who have not discharged PEs, and it was not my routine practice for a while, um, to actually think about it, and that's what this lecture is, is uh, designed to do, and uh, in addition with Dr. Bontempo's work on the AFib side as well. So here's some of the questions I'm gonna answer today, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get to a better place when it comes to letting some of these patients go home. So first, can I discharge a PE patient? The answer is yes. Well, WTR, what's the risk? What, what are we afraid of? What type of patient is safe for discharge? What pharmacotherapy can I actually use? And then wh who do I need to involve in this decision before I, before, I, before I do something that might not be done very commonly? So when you have a patient with a PE, and this is not just suspected PE, this is like you diagnosed the PE. They came in with chest pain, insurance of breath, you did the CT uh, or the VQ, and you found a PE. W here's what you're worried about, right? You're like, well, they don't look that sick. I could send them home, but what am I worried about? Well, are they gonna die? Of course, mortality, super important. Are they gonna die when I send them home? That's really bad. Are they gonna bleed? I know I'm gonna give them anticoagulation. I'm not just gonna send them home without that. So are they gonna bleed when I send them home? Are they gonna have another PE? Or are they gonna have a DVT? Is that gonna be, is that gonna happen when I send them home on whatever it is I'm gonna send them home on? Okay, those are three big things that you have to worry about when you're sending these patients home. Is the patient gonna be upset? Are they gonna be really annoyed at me that I sent them home because then they're gonna talk to everyone and they're gonna be like, I can't believe you went home and you have a blood clot in your lungs? Oh my God, that sounds like malpractice. That's terrible, okay? Is the family gonna be upset? Are they gonna be annoyed that you send their relative home with a blood clot in the lungs? And then, and this is probably the hardest one to answer, is the PCP or the specialist, whoever they follow up with, are they gonna sell you out? <laughs> are they gonna be like, wait, you're seeing me in follow-up? You had a pulmonary embolism and they sent, that ER sent you home. <laughs> oh my God, well, let me just fix the problem right now and I'm gonna call, you, you don't want that. Nobody wants that, right? Now, the evidence I'm gonna tell you today addresses some of these, but not all of these, and that's these four. Um, what we do have is pretty good evidence that patients are not going to die at home in the properly selected patient. Patients are not going to die at home, at least not at any higher rate than if you were to keep them. Patients aren't going to bleed significantly higher. They're not going to have another worsening PE, and they're actually going to be pretty happy with the situation. They're not going to be upset. I don't have an answer to the family piece, and I'm not sure anyone will, and I don't have an answer to the PCP or specialist selling you out piece, um, but, but there are ways to mitigate that. So current studies can answer those top four. Okay, so this is the big study. This is the one you really need to know. It's called the Zondag study, the Zondag-Hestia study. Now, when I heard this name, Zondag is the name of the primary author, and they call, uh, they, they call, Zondag calls the study the Hestia study. I was like, God, that sounds so Game of Thrones. It <laughs> sounds so like Lord of the Rings. It, it sounds like this, the Jade Enchantress, when an immortal spirit uh, chooses a mortal for her lover, trouble soon turns to disaster. So I was like, wow, Zondag, the Hestia study, it's the Zondag Hestia study. When an acute care clinician chooses to discharge a patient with a PE, 
trouble soon turns to disaster. And what I'm here to tell you is actually it's not disaster. It is actually a satisfied patient, a low risk profile, immense cost savings, and happy family members, okay? So actually we can do this, we can do this in the right patient, and this is really the goal. Now, what Zondag did, did was a, a cohort study, which means that they took a, a look at a bunch of PEs, uh, PE patients, and said, how do you do when you go home? This was not done in the United States, this was done in the Netherlands, Zondag is actually Dutch. So the primary outcome at 90 days, and this is a common primary outcome for these studies, primary outcome at 90 days was PE DVT, so recurrent PE, mortality, and bleeding, like we talked about. That's what you're afraid of, right? Death, bleeding, and another PE, or another DVT, okay? So they addressed all the good the outcomes that we want to know. What they found was, when they looked at this group of patients that they sent home, this was the rate, 2% of recurrent PE DVT, 1% of mortality, and 0.7% bleeding. They used Coumadin, they used low molecular weight heparin. That was their that was their uh, uh, treatment of choice, and they use low-risk patients, the Hestia criteria of, of low-risk patients. I'm just curious, does anyone know why it's called the Hestia study? I didn't know this. I actually emailed Zondag. It's Wendy Zondag in uh, Netherlands. I, didn't, I couldn't figure it out, and I was like, Dr. Zondag, I'm, I want to present your paper, but I don't know what Hestia means. Is it a place? Is it a, an acronym? What is it? Does anyone know? Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, Greek mythology, Hestia is the goddess of the home or the oh. hearth. So this was very, uh, uh, you know, hearkening back to Greek mythology is that these are the criteria that let you go home, the Hestia study, okay? Just thought that was kind of interesting. I thought it was really cool that she answered uh, right away. It was, mm -hmm. I don't know, within 24 hours for sure, so kind of neat. Okay, so here's how you, th these are the exclusion criteria. Here's how you cannot send these patients home. Here, here's the high risk stuff, all right? This is the stuff that are called the Hestia criteria, which means that if you get any of these, you can't send these patients home. And it's all the stuff you'd think about. It's all the high risk stuff. So if they're hemodynamically unstable, makes sense. You're not sending those patients home. If you're giving TPA or if you're doing an embolectomy, yeah, you're not gonna just say, all right, here's some TPA. Yeah, go home, you're, you'll be fine, no. If you're giving TPA, you're admitting them to the hospital, right? If they're active, we just heard a lot about bleeding and reversal, they have active bleeding or high risk of bleeding, okay? Uh, absolutely, you're not going to send those patients home. If they're already anticoagulated and then they develop a PE on top of that, so they're already treated and now they have a PE, yeah, you can't send those people home. If they require oxygen, okay? And, and they have specific criteria. You have to have oxygen that uh, is needed to maintain SATs greater than 90%. Okay, so it's, it's a significant degree of oxygen. If they, have, if they have requirements for IV analgesia, otherwise they can't go home. Like, in other words, their pain is so bad that they need IV analgesics, yeah, you can't send them home. And then if they have any of these following comorbidities, so bad infection, malignancy, bad renal disease, bad liver disease, and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, all those can't go home. Kind of makes sense. And if they're pregnant, they can't go home. And these are all the things you'd probably think about as high-risk patients, pretty reasonable stuff, and those are the Hestia criteria. So, yes, sir, question? What about a very big proximal? Yeah, the question was, what about a very big proximal, did you say DVT or PE? Yeah, that's a good question. They, they didn't necessarily exclude those patients. The, proc, the large proximal DVT gives you a higher risk of a PE, so, but once you've got the PE part of it, the proximal DVT is kind of, it's sort of like, it gave you the worst thing that it's going to give, and you are, you've already diagnosed that. Now, the other criteria, hemodynamically unstable, if it's that big, you're going to be hemodynamically unstable, submassive PE excluded, that kind of stuff. So the, any of the big PEs, those are excluded, and you kind of know who those patients are, right? You're not sending those home. It's the really low risk, that 35-year-old, totally healthy, happens to have a PE for whatever reason, no other problems, not hemodynamically unstable, not hypoxic, not severely tachycardic. That's the patient that kind of we're talking about here, very low risk. So, Hestia study, cohort study, yeah, that's great. It's a cohort study, which means you take a bunch of patients with a disease and you follow them and you're like, all right, what happened? Well, show me a randomized controlled trial before I'm going to change my practice. Well, here's one. Okay, so Ajeski. Ajeski et al. did a randomized controlled trial, 344 patients. They compared outpatient to inpatient, and the primary outcome was excellent. It was DVTPE, 
bleeding, mortality at 90 days. So the same primary outcomes. Great, because now you can compare one to the other, it, and, and everyone's happy that this is, the, this is a pretty good outcome. For our purposes in the ED, actually, I'd probably like a shorter-term outcome, a 30-day outcome, but it's very, we don't have those yet. Those studies may come out soon, but 90 days is good enough for me for now. So this was an unblinded, randomized controlled trial because they're comparing outpatient to inpatient. It would be awesome to do a blind, blinded uh, mm -hmm. controlled trial for outpatient to inpatient, like a virtual reality where you like, think you're going home, but you're actually, <laughs> and they, they recreate your hospital room just like your home. Uh, that can't happen probably, but, um, but uh, this was unblinded. And again, they, they used, again, low molecular weight heparin and Coumadin, okay? And they used something called a PESI score, which is similar to the Hestia criteria, a little bit different. It allows for a little higher risk patients, actually. So it's not as low risk as Hestia. It's a little higher risk when you have PESI 1 and 2. PESI stands for PE severity index, analogous to the pneumonia severity index, the PSI. So what do they find? So for those who were discharged, a 0.6% recurrent DVT rate, and it was zero in the admitted patients, but it wasn't statistically significantly different. That was, that's the point. And the person who had the recurrent PE, there was only one patient who had that out of the 170 some. The person who had the one, the one person who had the PE DVT was, had cervical cancer and had bilateral PEs diagnosed. So that was a high risk patient to begin with. W wouldn't have met the Hestia, cr Hestia criteria at all, happened to meet the PESI criteria. So the point was is that recurrent PE DVT occurred at the exact at the same rate, statistically speaking. The death rate was the same. It was one patient in both arms. And the bleeding rate was 1.8%. There were two total bleeds. That also was statistically not significant. Um, it just happened to be more than the 0%. And the two patients both had intramuscular bleeds. One of those had an IVC filter in place. So really only one patient who had an intramuscular bleed who was sent home who was not high risk. Um, when you have an IVC filter, clearly there's something going on with the with the uh, vasculature, so, um, so and, and there was no statistical difference even with those two patients, so really no difference. As you can imagine, when you send someone home versus admitting them to the hospital, the mean length of stay is gonna be very different. The interesting thing about this is that if you can get them out of the hospital, 0.5 days, this exact same severity patient, they're only in the hospital for, six, for, for 12 hours. If you leave them in the hospital, this is the same severity patient. They stay for four days, mm -hmm. four days. So that tells you that they're doing totally fine at home or equally fine at home, and they're staying four days in the hospital because we can't manage to get them out. Once they're in, they're not necessarily sicker, they're just in. And so we just assume that we should do a bunch of stuff on them when we don't need to, okay? So we got a nice randomized controlled trial. We got it using Com Coumadin Lovenox, that's great. Um, this is the PESI, or the simplified PESI, just for your reference, and uh, they have a 30-day mortality on this of 1.1% when you uh, have none of these criteria. So this is a high-risk criteria. This is available on MD-CALC. If you're able to avoid all these high-risk criteria, the 30-day the mortality is 1.1%, and the bleeding rate is 1.5. It's just a different scale than the Hestia. Some people use Hestia, Hestia some people use PESI. So it's just wanted to let, let you know. Now. You, you're now on the same page, like, okay, I think a patient who's a low risk for PE, that is, if I use the Hestia criteria, I might be able to discharge them. I think I can discharge that patient. That's great. Do I have to give them Coumadin and low molecular weight heparin? Can I use one of the DOACs? The answer is yes, you can. And actually, we heard from this author yesterday. For those of you who stayed, Frank Peacock actually did this work, and he gave us the uh, lecture yesterday during lunch. But Peacock determined that you could discharge them with uh, rivaroxaban versus standard care, which in most cases was low molecular weight heparin and Coumadin, and um, about three quarters of the standard care got some kind of heparin first. So, and what you find is that the primary outcomes of time and major bleeding at 90 days and the secondary outcomes of death and PE, so we, again, bleeding, death, PE, all on there, and uh, Peacock also looked at time, and what he found was hospitalization time obviously is less when you send them home, it makes sense, five versus 34 hours, and no difference in the bleeding, death, or PE rates. So we showed that in a low risk patient, they do okay, low risk inpatient versus outpatient, they do okay, inpatient versus outpatient in an RCT, and then this one is low molecular weight heparin Coumadin, our standard care, versus rivaroxaban, and they're both the same. So we've hopefully answered some of these questions for you. Now, 
how do you get the buy-in? Well, you do need to talk about some of this stuff, in a, in obviously in layman's terms, when you're talking to the patient and the family. On the PCP side and on the specialist side, you want to have these conversations ahead of time. You've now heard several times from several speakers that, hey, a lot of this stuff shouldn't occur at two in the morning. This should occur before this happens so that everyone's on the same page that you can send them home. And so I think the specialists you probably want to consider are, depending on your institution, hemonc, pulmonology, cardiology might be the ones. And then the other ones I would suggest, especially for the leaders in the room, the medical directors, the associate medical directors, um, hospital administration and C-suite. You might want to let them know if you're starting to send home pulmonary emboli because uh, they don't want to get a call from a board member or something else saying, oh, I had a blood clot in my lungs and they sent me home and I can't believe it. Or a primary care doctor calls them and chews them out. You should have these conversations ahead of time. So that's the reason I'm not going to tell you tomorrow you should go discharge a PE. No, you shouldn't do that. What you should do is become familiar with the HESTIA criteria and raise the question, hey, you know, medical executive committee, yeah, specialist, PCPs, let's talk about this. Can we start to discharge some low-risk PEs, get them on board, and once that is on, once you have some buy-in, then, then consider doing this, okay? So, we talked about can I discharge a PE patient? Yes, we can. WTR, what's the risk? We talked about that. PE death and bleeding, all less than or equal to hospitalization risk in properly selected patients. What type of patient? Who, what is that proper selection? So the Hestia criteria or the PESI score, that can help you risk, status, risk uh, stratify. And then what pharmacotherapy can I use? Well, you can certainly use low molecular weight heparin or Coumadin, uh, with Coumadin, or you can use rivaroxaban, and you can probably also use uh, apixaban and the others, although I don't know the data on apixaban and some of the other DOACs uh, relative to rivaroxaban. Um, but rivaroxaban is certainly reasonable. It would be reasonable to assume that the others would be fine. And then who do I need to involve in the decision? As obviously, the patient and family at the time of care, but PCP specialists and at the protocol level, make sure that they're involved. So, yes, sir, you had a question. Right. So the question was, who can we use rivaroxaban in? Can't use them in cancer, can't use them in, in the renal function. Those two, are, those two are the main ones. And the nice thing is, both of those two are exclusion criteria anyways for sending home someone with a PE. So it's nice that that fits very easily. It's like, ah, I only have to remember, because they wouldn't have made your criteria anyways, because they would have been in the Hestia. So yeah, good question though. Yeah. Question two. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. In fact, the um, Hestia criteria, the Hestia studies excluded all those who were hemodynamically unstable, had troponin abnormalities, had anything that was high risk, anything that looked bad or, or um, uh, that looked serious, to the point where it, it was like, it, it's almost obvious to anyone who's an experienced clinician that you're really dealing with the lowest of the low risk. And the point here is, even with the lowest of the low risk patients, most of us are not sending those home. And that's true throughout the country, by the way. This is not an exception that only about 10 people raise their hands saying they've discharged a PE. So, yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Laura, and uh, we'll do the AFib side. All right, excellent. Thank you. I'll tell you, at a, a course, CME course in Boston, I don't know, 10 plus years ago, I was given the lecture trying to convince people to send DVTs home. So we've, we've certainly done that. That's, that's no longer an issue, and now we're moving on, on to PE. So things keep evolving. Um, Amr said he's not going to tell you to go back and discharge your PE patient tomorrow. I am going to tell you to go back and discharge your appropriate AFib patient tomorrow because uh, this is much farther ahead, and the data is much more robust, and pathways are much more developed than in PE. So AFib. AFib is a disease of aging. Very few patients under age 60 have AFib. Really only about 2% of AFib is found in patients under 60. But by the time you get to 80, 10% of the population has atrial fibrillation. So definitely an increase in incidence as age goes up. Uh, for the patients we know about, there are about 33.5 million people in the world that have AFib, and six, approximately 6 million of those patients are right here in the United States. So you're certainly going to be taking care of those patients. Um, where do those patients go when they have trouble with their AFib? Well, they come to see you in the emergency department. And if you look, the incidence of presentations to the emergency department for AFib keeps going up. And over the course of the eight years on the slide, there's a 31% increase in emergency department visits for AFib and AFib-related complaints. You're all going to take care of these patients. They're coming in to see you. But here's the really interesting part. 
The orange bars on the bottom indicate the percent of admissions for all patients with any chief complaint coming to the emergency department. Then pretty steady over the course of many years. The blue is the percent of patients admitted with a chief complaint related to their AFib. It is significantly higher than all comers. It's somewhere around 70%. But if you look, it's going down. So if we overlie these two graphs, the number of patients coming to the emergency department is going up, but the number of patients being admitted for their AFib is going down. AFib is becoming an outpatient disease. Okay. So when a patient comes into your emergency department with AFib, maybe they're in AFib with RVR, have some AFib-related complaint. First thing you have to do is obviously determine the patient's stability. We're not talking about sending anyone home who's unstable, right? Any, any evidence the patient's having angina or they're in congestive heart failure or they're, or they're hypotensive, that, that's, these are not the people we're talking about. You're going to follow your standard atrial fibrillation management for those patients. You have to, of course, exclude really dangerous causes of the patient having the AFib in the first place. Do they have severe metabolic derangements? Did they just overdose on a sympathomimetic? Are they thyrotoxic? Do they have a PE? Are any of those things the cause of the AFib, so the AFib is secondary to another underlying medical problem? If that's not the case, and you have run-the-mill, primary, hemodynamically stable AFib, you really have three choices, three ways to approach these patients. Rhythm control, rate control, and sort of the newest kid on the block is wait and see. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, as well. I don't know if anyone's implementing that, that pathway yet, sort of brand new, not really adapted in this country yet, but on the horizon, so we will talk about that. First of all, rhythm control. Who's, where do we look for rhythm control? Who's great and aggressive on rhythm control? Well, we looked north for rhythm control for the emergency department, right? We looked to Canada. Ian Seal and his group started the Ottawa Aggressive Protocol, really talked about early aggressive rhythm control of patients with AFib in the ED. That is not this study. This study is looking at the safety, the outcomes of these patients after they were sent home from the emergency department. So any of you can cardiovert someone. That's not the question. The question is, is it safe to do so? And if you send them home, are you harming the patient? Are you helping the patient? What's going on? So they took patients who were hemodynamically stable in the emergency department with AFib, with RVR. They had to have their symptoms for fewer than 48 hours. So it always brings up the question, what if my patient can't feel their AFib? There's this idea of the silent AFib, the patient's in AFib, <coughs> excuse me, and we, and we just, so we don't really know how long the patient's in AFib. Every study about thromboembolic risk that I've come across is based on the patient's symptoms. This is not someone who went to their doctor's office and incidentally happened to be found to be in AFib and don't have any symptoms, not these patients. Someone who comes in and says, for fewer than 48 hours, I have felt palpitations, I have felt my heart racing, I have felt jittery, whatever the complaint may be. Third criteria for inclusion was someone who's had their symptoms for fewer than seven days, but was already anticoagulated for something else. Just happened to get lucky and already be anticoagulated. Oh, and now they're here with this tachydysrhythmia of atrial fibrillation or aflutter. So we talked about they excluded patients with a secondary process of something else that could be reversed as causing the AFib, and of course, patients were unstable. They sent 91% of these patients home from the emergency department, and 80% of them went home in sinus rhythm. But really, this study was not about that. The, the intervention was not about how to treat the patients. This is Canada. They cardioavert everyone. I think if you come in for glaucoma, they cardioavert you. I'm not sure. They're very aggressive about cardioverting up there, and they get patients home. This was about outcomes. And there were a little over 1,000 patients, 1,090 patients. And at four-week follow-up, there was one patient who had a stroke. So 0.1% well within the risk tolerance threshold for most of us in the emergency department, or in medicine in general, actually. So 0.1% adverse event on these patients, and they were all able to go home. So that's Canada. We know they're aggressive with AFib. Let's look elsewhere around the world and see what's going on. This is a study done. It was a what-if study. They surveyed, this group surveyed physicians from around the world. These are the four main groups that were represented and said, what if? What if a patient came into your emergency department with AFib, with RVR, the rapid ventricular response, what would you do? And the questions were things like, would you cardiovert the patient in the emergency department? And if you look in Canada, obviously, but also in the United Kingdom and in Australia, 50, approximately 50% or more of docs said, yeah, I would cardiovert that patient. And the U.S. is just simply lagging behind at about 25%. So about one in four docs asked in the theoretical, not the patient right in front of them, three quarters of the docs said they would not consider cardioverting that patient, and one fourth said that they would. And then the mo next most important question is, okay, so you cardiovert them. 
congratulations, they're, they're in science rhythm, would you send these patients home? And Canada and Australia said, sure, get, get them home, get them a follow up with primary care doctors. UK was significantly lower, probably more of a function of their healthcare system, the way it's structured there, and the US was obviously far behind uh, both Canada and Australia, saying that even if I did cardiovert this patient, even if I was successful, a little over half the doctors are still going to admit that patient to the hospital. So this is new for us here in the United States. This is not new, though. Our colleagues from around the world are sort of way ahead of the curve on us on this, primarily treating stable atrial fibrillation as an outpatient disease. But the question always comes, is it safe, right? I think that's why we're risk adverse, and in this country, I think we're particularly risk adverse. We don't want to hurt anyone, which is a good thing. So let's look at some other data. We know the Ian Steele study said 0.1% adverse outcome rate. Here's another one. You have to think about what you're going to do. What are the primary risks of sending someone home? Well, y you worry. We worry about giving people strokes. That's what we worry about. That's, that's the dreaded outcome of AFib. You worry about the AFib coming back and needing to come back to the emergency department. I'll classify those as inconveniences. Not really dangerous. The patient doesn't want to come back. They don't want to go back to your waiting room. They probably don't want to see you again. Uh, but they, if they have to come back, they have to come back. Probably no harm, no foul there. And then there's these secondary risks that it didn't work. If you tried to convert them, it didn't work. That happens. Nothing, nothing is 100% of the time. And the risks associated with sedation. Now, that one I'm not worried about. Everyone here knows how to sedate folks. And this procedure is literally a fraction of a second. It takes a fraction of a second to cardiovert someone. So you can use ultra short acting agents. The patient could you know, hold their breath. Even if they went completely apneic with a short acting agent, this happens fast enough that there should be no adverse events to that patient whatsoever. So the secondary risk of sedation, not really a particular concern to me. But let's go back to this part, thromboembolic risk. This is perfectly consistent with the Ian Steele study that said their adverse event was 0.1%. For this population, <coughs> excuse me, this patient group, 0.06 to 0.7%. Right? The risk is low. Nothing's going to be zero. We all want the risk to be zero. Nothing's going to be zero. So the risk of someone going home, the appropriately screened patient, the low risk, stable, primary AFib patient, symptoms less than 48 hours, going home, if you choose to rhythm control them, could be electricity, could be pharmacologic, that's up to you. The risk of them going home is low. They do not need to stay in the hospital unless you have identified some reason for them to stay in the hospital. So I asked you to approach the AFib patient as, how am I going to get this patient home? And then see if you find something that needs to bring that patient in versus I assume I'm going to admit my AFib patient unless I can convince myself somehow I can get them home. Because other places are doing this, other countries are doing this, and it's happening more and more in this country as you saw from the data earlier. Okay, so what if we go on to rate control? Rate control is relatively straightforward, right? Rate control, you're not touching the rhythm. You're just turning down the miles per hour that the heart is going. If the patient is just having palpitations and you get their heart rate with a beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker, really whatever you wish to use, whichever agent, less than 110 beats per minute and the patient's feeling okay, they're rate controlled. You don't have to be under 90, you don't have to be under 80, less than 110, that's called lenient rate control. There were no adverse outcomes compared to strict rate control of a heart rate less than 80. Now, if your patient is symptomatic, yeah, you want to turn that down farther. So if, you know, the, if your heart rate's going 108 and you're all happy, but the patient still feels uncomfortable because they can feel that heart pounding in their chest, bring it down a little farther. If the patient's feeling okay, heart rate's between 100 and 110, you're good. Your patient is rate controlled. No benefit to that patient coming into the hospital. And of course, we're going to talk about risk stratifying all these patients for thromboembolic event. But the rate, rate control and rhythm control, if you have achieved your goal of either the rhythm control or rate control less than 110 beats per minute in asymptomatic patient, congratulate yourselves. You've managed the AFib with RVR. The patient is stable. That patient can be handled as an outpatient. All right. Then there's this new idea of the wait and see strategy, which is essentially, eh, let's see what happens to you. Patient comes into the emergency department with AFib with RVR. This is a study done in the Netherlands. We're back to the Netherlands. Armour talked about the Netherlands earlier. Uh, you'll see why it was not done in the United States and why it's not ready for prime time here, but 15 sites in the Netherlands, about 600 uh, patients they took a look at. And patients presented fewer than 48 hours of symptoms, generally fewer than 36 hours of symptoms. AFib or a flutter with RVR. They came in, did all the standard stuff, made sure the patient was stable, looked to see if there was any precipitant to this AFib, that could be reversed. If they didn't find any of those things, they said, all right, in this study, half of you went directly to rhythm control, 
so pharmacologic or electricity, and half they said, bye, see ya. The heart rate was going fast. They did rate control that patient, but that was not the end goal. This was really a rhythm control study. They got that patient's rate to where the rate was tolerable for the patient. During less than 110 beats per minute, the patient went home. And this is the difference between what can be done in the Netherlands and what can be done here. The patient went home and they had their follow-up appointment within 48 hours from their symptom onset. So sometimes the follow-up appointment was like 10 hours later from the time they left the emergency department. But those patients went home, they come back for their follow-up appointment. Of the patients in the wait and see category, what percent of patients do you think were in sinus rhythm by the time of that follow-up appointment, which sometimes was just a few hours after they left the ED? Someone, just give me a guess. Ah, oh, I, I wish I had a price. 70%. 70% of patients on their own with maybe some rate control if it was needed uh, were back in sinus rhythm by the time they had their follow-up appointment. They wait and they saw. They fixed themselves, they were done. For the 30% that weren't back in sinus rhythm, that were still in AFib, those folks got sent back to the emergency department, they were seen immediately, they were rhythm controlled with the pharmacologic or electrical cardio version, and then they continued their workup as an outpatient after that. So clearly based on our system and follow-up and protocols, we're not ready for that in the US yet, but it is new, and the idea is that Sometimes less is more. We talked about that with the high blood pressure. And this may be another case where if we can arrange in a really tight follow-up and make sure that all these algorithms are in place. I mean, you'd pass your 48-hour mark in my waiting room sometimes, I have to say, if they bounce you. If you're in that 30% and you come back to see me and I have like two hours, we're d you're done. Forget it. I, I, I've blown it. But if protocols are in place to have, to have this process happen, maybe doing nothing may be the thing to do. Okay. All right. Speaking of algorithms. This was a study that was done, which just says, if your ED has a plan, like most things, if you have a plan, you do better, right? It was choose your own adventure. Patients came in with AFib. The doc could choose rhythm control. The doc could choose rate control. They could choose pharmacologic. They could choose electricity. The, it was the doctor's choice to choose one of these algorithms. But the patient marched down the algorithm, whichever one was chosen by that physician. And when they got to the bottom, if the patient had either uh, rate or rhythm control, either way, if the patient was stabilized, say rate was controlled, the patient went home. And the risk of adverse outcome in follow-up was also in that significantly less than 1%. So we have proof upon proof upon proof that this is a safe thing to do, and our neighbors across the world are doing this much more than we are. So before you send people out, before you send people out for AFib, before you admit someone for AFib, I ask you to stop and think about the patient and say, what's really going to benefit for that patient? When they come in the hospital, what's going to happen inpatient that can't be done as an outpatient? I often hear things like echo. They can get an echo. Well, patients can get echoes as outpatients, and the echo often does not change the outcome or the immediate management of that AFib patient. I hear things like serial troponins, cardiac markers. I got to check cardiac markers. You don't have to check cardiac markers on AFib patients. If they're going fast and they don't come in with chest pain or unexplained diaphoresis or anything that is suggestive of ACS, it is a wire problem. It's not a pipe problem. Patients with AFib, AFib is not a risk factor for coronary artery disease. Okay? So wire problem, pipe problem. If your patient comes in with their a dysrhythmia, their heart's going fast, they feel palpitations, they might even feel a little lightheaded from their palpitations. That certainly happens. It doesn't mean that they have to have an ACS workup. So there's that. I just ask you to stop and reconsider your usual care. But before you discharge or admit anyone, you have to think about the thromboembolic risk event. We talked about how it was low, right? Less than 1%. But that doesn't mean there you can do nothing. Here, so you have to just do it. You have to risk stratify everyone, and decide who needs an anticoagulant. Standard. Don't defer this to the next person. That's your patient. The risk it starts as soon as they're in AFib, really when you cross a 48-hour mark, but th it, it increases as soon as AFib starts and increases much more after the 48-hour mark, you need to think about anticoagulating patients. So this is not new. This is the chats 2 vast score. You've all seen this. I bet you all use this. You take a look at it. You plug your patient's risk factors in. You come up with a number, and you decide what to do with that number. In 2019, and sorry, this is, this is the increased risk of cardiovascular event, a uh, thromboembolic event as your chats 2 vast score goes up. So the higher your chats 2 vast score, the higher risk of a thromboembolic event. And right here, when your chats 2 vast score is 2, you cross approximately that 2% threshold where we say, okay, my risk tolerance 
is 2% or less, I've crossed the 2%, I can't have you up in this range over here going home or coming into the hospital. Either way, it doesn't change your risk of having a stroke. Where you are physically doesn't change that. So everyone needs a chance to vast score. And then, in 2019, the ACC, AHA, uh, Heart Rhythm Society all came out and they put out a focused update on the management of AFib. And one of the focuses of that focused update was really about thromboembolic risk. There wasn't really big changes elsewhere. It was really focused on the thromboembolic risk and the chats to vast score. Here's how they put it, and then I'm going to try and simplify it for you a little bit. A man with a chats to vast score of zero or a woman with a chats to vast score of one, leave them alone. They don't need anticoagulation. They don't need it. Their risk is so low that the risk of anticoagulation outweighs the risk of having a thromboembolic event. If a man has a chats to vast score of two or more, or a woman has a chats to vast score of three or more, they need anticoagulation. They've crossed that 2% threshold, they need anticoagulation. You can anticoagulate them with a NOAC or a DOAC, which, uh, whichever one you want to call it, a direct oral anticoagulant. The score for men is one, and the score for women is two. It's unclear. It's really unclear what to do, because the risk there is less than 2%, but higher than 1%. It's not really clear which way to go. There's no definitive recommendation here. And they come up with, it's reasonable to omit anticoagulation therapy. So this is really a risk-benefit discussion, risk stratification, risk-sharing um, discussion with your patient, all of those things. You have to talk about the risk, talk about the ben benefits, maybe look at your individual patient, look at their HADS blood score, see if they're at increased risk, see how anticoagulation is going to impact their lifestyle, and make a decision. So that's a lot of numbers. I can't keep all those numbers in my head. So looking at all this, I'm just going to simplify it for you. Absent gender. If an individual has one additional risk factor beyond, has, has one additional risk factor beyond their gender for having a thromboembolic event, you can consider anticoagulation or not. Absent of gender, if they have no risk factors for a thromboembolic event, do not anticoagulate. Absent gender, if they have two or more risk factors for a thromboembolic event, do anticoagulate. So no additional risk factors, no anticoagulation, Two additional risk factors, anticoagulate. One additional risk factor, you have to do shared decision making with your patient. Simplifies it in my mind a lot more than remembering all these numbers up here. The other thing to know that in this focused update is NOAX or DOAX. Warfarin is so 2018, we're over it. We're over warfarin, okay? We're over it. It's all, it's all DOAX. As you saw, the lunchtime lecture, the onset of action is between two and four hours. There's no need for bridging. There's no need for shots. Give your patient their first dose in the emergency department. Make sure they have the ability to afford their medication. They can get to a pharmacy because this is not one of the drugs you want to start and stop. Get them on a direct oral anticoagulant, okay, for eligible patients. In the end, if your patient is stable, You've ruled out dangerous etiologies. You don't have a secondary effect, meaning there's no evidence of ischemia. The patient's not having chest pain. They haven't passed out. Any of those things can just a fart failure. Think about risk stratification and outpatient management. Having an algorithm set up is great. Not having an algorithm set up, you are well within the standard of care based on national guidelines, based on the work of our colleagues in, in other countries, but also the ACC, AHA, all of these have guidelines out there about management for these patients. They don't specifically address disposition. I will tell you that. There's no guideline that says these patients can go home and these patients can, can come in. But there are guidelines as far as how to manage the patient, who needs what, and if you can meet those patients' needs, evaluate their thromboembolic risk, and arrange for follow-up, the patient doesn't benefit from coming into the hospital. So I ask you to pause and rethink your standard of care for AFib. It's easy to admit AFib patients, right? Someone comes in with AFib, people aren't going to argue with you at this point anyway, right now, for admitting that patient. But it's not necessarily going to benefit the patient. And with hospital beds being a hot commodity as much as any other thing in medicine these days, you really have to think about it. So obviously we're here to benefit the patient. Let's talk about what else happens. This is hospital charges for patients associated with AFib. The green are patients who go home. The red are patients who get admitted. So although we are admitting fewer patients, the amount of money we're spending is going up because the per capita spending on admitted patients for AFib is going up. Fewer patients are coming in, we're spending more on each patient. This country spends a lot of money on AFib. 
Any estimates? What do you think? How much do we lay out in this country for AFib? We said hypertension earlier, which is actually more common than AFib. We spend $51 billion. How much do you think we spend in AFib? Any guesses? Nobody? Okay. Well, somewhere between 15 billion and 26 billion, depending on the source that you read, on AFib alone, direct and indirect related expenses. So, you know, my salary doesn't change if I admit or discharge that patient. It doesn't benefit me anyhow, e either way. I want to do the right thing for the patient, but the patient will get out of the hospital faster, have less risk of hospital associated injury, hospital associated infection, and you'll keep the medical ca cost down for that patient. I'm a big advocate of getting patients home. I discharge every AFib patient that I can. I'm not cavalier about it. If someone is in any way unstable, if I'm worried about that patient, if I can't even say exactly why, I'm going to bring that patient in. But if they meet the criteria for going home, they're going to go home. There's not a benefit from them coming in. Okay, questions about AFib? Who sends their AFib patients home in general? Good. So I see maybe about 20% of you. And for those of you who don't, what are your barriers? Is it just an individual comfort level? Is it a hospital level, administrative level, patient level? Postprandial level, any of you? You guys all just ate, I know. Okay, all right, just check. Glucose level, is that the issue? <laughs> no? Okay, yeah, sir. Um, so, the is well. so the issue is with not knowing the time of onset getting transesophageal echoes, that's entirely reasonable. These studies all look to patients with symptoms for fewer than 48 hours. So we're not there yet. We may get there. We may get to discharge patients to home with anticoagulation and outpatient TEE scheduled. But the data right now is talking about a, a, a subset, but a very prominent subset, high percentage subset of patients with AFib. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, how long after achieving rate control with something like an IV calcium channel blocker do you watch the patient? I watch them until I know that the oral dose has kicked in. So if I give them the IV dose and I've achieved rate control, I will very quickly follow it with the oral dose. Because the IV, if you use something like deltiazem, doesn't last particularly long, and the oral takes some time to kick in. So you actually need some overlap between the IV. If you wait for them to go back up, you've lost some of the ground that, that you've made. So I'll give them the oral dose. I'll watch them for probably about three hours thereafter, make sure that IV dose is worn off, it's gone, that whatever is happening with their heart rate is based on the pill that they've taken or whatever else I've corrected along the way, and then I can get the patient home. All right. Getting patients home. You ever hear the three C's of getting a patient home? They need a car, so they need a way to get back to you. They need a caregiver. They need someone who can look after them. And they need a clue. They need a clue as to when to come back. So if you are worried that a patient will go home and they'll have palpitations and have chest pain and not come back to you, maybe that's not the patient to put in to here. So transportation, someone to look after them, and a clue as to when to come back. Anybody else? Yes? So, in the end, uh, so the question was about someone with known history of paroxysmal AFib versus new onset AFib. These, the Ian Steele criteria apply to both, and so those patients that had their symptoms for fewer than seven days but already were on anticoagulants, a lot of those patients were on anticoagulants because they have a history of AFib. And this is just another recrudescence of their AFib with a rapid ventricular response. So, no, it can be new onset AFib. New onset AFib is definitively not a criteria for someone coming into the hospital. And those patients actually tend to do better right, because you, you rate control them or you rhythm control them early on, and then they can have their whole workup done as an outpatient. Anybody else? All right, so think about it. I asked you to think about it. We want you to send everyone home. Send home your high blood pressure, send home your PE, send home your AFib. Just empty out your hospitals. Get them out of there. All right? That's it. Thank you.